Alright, well, I want to go ahead and get started so that I can give Dr. Brooke uh, as much time as he uh, take. We'll see if we can get that taken care of. Um, I'm not going to talk very long because I, you guys can come yeah, see yeah. that. Uh, but Dr. Brook, I, one thing that I really appreciate about him is he's going to get you to think. He's going to challenge um, oh, some, of, yeah. some of your basic premises. So <laughs> it's haunting your question. Uh, but some basic premises that you have. Uh, and, and I just I invite you to come and, and listen. And, uh, the greatest thing about it is to get you to the table. So uh, let me see the floor. And I'll have that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are chairs up here, and I promise I don't hit. So the three chairs up here, four chairs, and a third row here. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Um, so I'm going to make, since we've got a, a bit of a condensed time frame, I'm going to make some assumptions uh, and feel free to challenge me on those assumptions in the uh, in the question period. This, the main assumption I'm going to make is that free markets, capitalism, works. If you care about standard of living, if you care about wealth, if you care about the fate of the poor, if you care about the quality of life, the standard of living of individuals, there has never been a better political economic system in the history of mankind than capitalism. Now I think the evidence for that is unequivocal. I'll just give you a few quick highlights, just so we don't make it you know, completely random that I'm st starting from that point of view. How many people 250 years ago, what percentage of the population was poor? What percentage of the population was poor? And, and take poor, I don't know, a buck a day of income. One dollar a day of income, that's pretty poor. What percentage of the population do you think had that level of poverty 250 years ago? In other words, before capitalism? 50%. 50. 90, 95, yeah, 99, closer to 99. Pretty much everybody, when the United States of America was founded, almost the entire population of the United States, by any standard that we have today, was dirt poor. If you look at income during the history of mankind, Income, and I'm going to draw a big graph, right? This is the graph, this is time, and this is wealth. Or well, income, doesn't really matter. Income is flat, start minus 10,000 BC. Income is flat, it goes up and down a little bit, Roman Empire goes up a little bit, then it comes down, and it stays flat, and then it goes like that. Like that, right? Way up there. That is the Industrial Revolution, that is capitalism. And what's interesting is that that's in the West it goes up like that, starting in about 1776, let's say. It's a great date, 1776, because two things happened that year. One is what? Declaration of Independence. This is Christian Valley, right? What's the second thing that happens in 1776? What book is published in 1776? Adult, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Students, Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, first real book defining kind of a capitalist free market economics. Right? So Wealth of Nations, founding of this country, the Industrial Revolution, all started around this time and it's no accident. They're all happening at the same time. So you get this increase. What's interesting is, at the rest of the world, let's take Asia for example, they didn't have the Industrial Revolution. They didn't have what we had in 1776. So they, their income level stayed flat until about 1978, when it goes boom, like that again. What happened in 1978? They start freeing up the economies, they start adopting capitalism, they adopt free markets, and they create wealth, and they become richer. And over the last 30 years, over the last 30 years, the statistic you won't hear anyway, but it's true, over 600 million people, 600 million people, have come out of poverty into the middle class in places like China, 
Korea, Vietnam even, all of Asia. Why? <laughs> Why? Because of Keynesians, Keynesianism or socialism or communism? No, those systems have all kept them poor because of free markets, because of capitalism to the extent it's been practiced. So to the extent countries adopt free market principles, to the extent that they adopt capitalism, wealth is created. Again, true everywhere. Even, even in terms of the welfare of the poor, poor people are far, far better off under capitalism than under any other system. <coughs> so capitalism works. However, in the West, in the United States, in uh, Europe, we have been moving away from capitalism for at least a hundred years. So there's this been systematic erosion of the principles, the ideas of free markets and of capitalism. More and more and more, let me just ask, what, what, when I say free markets, what do I mean? Free of what? Students. I've been out of student. Free of what? Free of government. Free of regulations. Free of controls. Free of government intervention. So just a little, a little aside, when people say the financial crisis was caused by capitalism and by free markets, that is on its face false. You don't have to know any economics. You don't have to know why the financial crisis happened to know that it couldn't have been because of free markets. Why is it? Because in 2007, did we have no, were we free of regulation, free of government control, free of government intervention? No. So what we had in 2007 wasn't free markets. So it couldn't be that free markets failed. Something failed. But it couldn't be free markets because we didn't have them. As it happens, the industries that failed, finance, housing, mortgages, are the most regulated industries in America. So it obviously can't be capitalism and free markets that fail because it's the most regulated industries that fail. So free markets means free of regulations, free of government control, free of government intervention. Free markets mean no government control over the economy, no regulation. That's what they mean. So, we don't have free markets, and indeed we've been moving away from them for a hundred years. Slowly, but systematically moving away from them. So this is the puzzle that I think concerns a lot of people like me who believe in capitalism, believe in free markets. I think a lot of Americans kind of instinctually believe in capitalism, believe in free markets. Then why are we so eager to move away from it. And this is not about politics, because it's not true that Republicans are pro-free markets and Democrats are anti-free markets. Republicans are just as much against free markets as Democrats are, as illustrated by the way they govern, not by what they say. Talk is cheap. What matters is action. What matters is what you do in life, but not what you say in life. And by their actions, Republicans regulate they control, they do everything as much as Democrats, or almost as much. So there's almost political unanimity about moving away from free markets. And the question is why? If free markets really are as good as I'm claiming they are, and I think they are, why do we move against them? What is so abhorrent? What is so bad about capitalism? What is so negative about free markets that causes us to move away from the system that produces all this wealth, all these goodies that raises the standard of living, everybody, that's even good for the poor. And it, indeed, we adopt programs regularly. We adopt programs in this country that hurt poor people, that lower our standard of living. And then, you know, ask me about it in Q&A because there are dozens of these programs usually in the name of helping poor people, we hurt them. But why is it so acceptable to do that? What is it about capitalism that we find so abhorrent? What is it about capitalism that when a financial crisis happens, before anybody knows the facts, 
before anybody's examined the evidence, before anybody's looked at the economic causes of it, we all know what happened. Who do we blame the financial crisis on? Who do we blame the financial crisis on? What? Did we blame it on the government? You, you, you were not. You had the minority of Americans at that time. Who did the press, who did the most of Americans, who did they blame it on? Wall Street, right? Free markets, capitalism, with big titles in newspapers. Capitalism has failed. What is it about capitalism that's so negative? So what's capitalism about? What are free markets about? What are all markets about? Why do we participate in markets? Again, students would ask a question. Why did Steve Jobs make this? It's an iPhone, those in the back. Why did he make this? To make money, right? So he made this to make money, right? For a profit, you know what the profit margin on these things is? Well, when the first iPhones came out, there was a little competition. Profit margin was over 60%. If Steve Jobs built the iPhone for me and for you, he would have sold it for half price and still made a little bit of a profit. Steve Jobs wanted to make money, so he built an iPhone. Is that the only reason he built the iPhone? What else? What else made him build this? He wanted to change living standards. Was he again really concerned about your living standards? What did he want to do? Steve Jobs loved this stuff. He loved building beautiful things. Efficient things, effective things, things that, that, that you know, uh, 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 you know, perfectly beautiful and function well. So this is passion. This is about Steve Jobs engaging with his passion, with his love of working, with his love of creating, with his love of building. Most creators, most builders, do what they do out of a love for what they're doing. They love this. So Steve Jobs built this to make money, and he built this because he loved doing it. So Steve Jobs built the iPhone for whom? Who did he build this for? Steve Jobs. For Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs built this for Steve. How many, how, many, uh, how many people did he ask whether this would be a good product to make or not? Focus groups. Anybody know? Zero. None. Steve Jobs built what he thought was beautiful, and he assumed we would all like it. Now, when I went to buy my first iPhone, 2008, the US economy is spiraling out of control, right? We're going into deep recession. I went to buy my first iPhone because I wanted to stimulate the US economy. Because I care about you guys, and I didn't want you to, people to be unemployed. Because I know that's why all of you go to the mall. You go to the mall because you care about your fellow man and you want to make sure they have jobs, and you all believe in Keynesianism that consumption drives the economy. So you want to be good consumers so that other people Right? That's why you go to the mall? Anybody go to the mall for that reason? I didn't think so. Right? You go to the mall to satisfy whose desires? Your own. You go to the mall to make yourself more productive by buying an iPhone maybe, cooler by buying an iPhone maybe, look good by buying nice clothes. You go and shop and consume because it's in whose self-interest? Your own. <coughs> Capitalism, <coughs> markets, about the pursuit of self-interest. They're about consumers and producers coming into the marketplace, each pursuing their own self-interest, each trying to make their lives better by buying or selling the things that they're buying or selling. This is true of every market. And this is magnified in free markets where there's so many goods, there's so many producers, so many consumers. But that's what we engage in in a market. People tell me that uh, Wall Street was all about making money in 2006, 2007, and that's what caused the financial crisis. And my answer to that is Wall Street's always about making money. It should be about making money, that's their job. That's what they're about. So, markets are always about self-interest. That's what they're about. 
And this is not a new observation. If you, if you read, if you ever read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, Adam Smith makes this point. He says in 1776, he says, the baker doesn't bake the bread. They didn't have iPhones in those days, so they used bread as an example. Right? He doesn't bake the bread to make you feel happy. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't even know who you are. <coughs> he bakes the bread because he's trying to feed his family. He bakes his bread because this is an enjoyable profession for him. He bakes his bread because it's in his self-interest to bake his bread. And you buy the bread not because you care about the baker and his family and him trying to make a living. You're buying the bread because it's in your self-interest to buy the bread. So, marketplace is where people meet to pursue their self-interest. And it's an interesting phenomenon, this pursuit of self-interest in the marketplace. Because the way we do it is through trade. Right? We exchange good for good. I paid $300, I think $400 for this one. $400 for this iPhone, right? How much is this iPhone worth to me? Some economics student. How much is the iPhone worth to me if I pay $400 for it? You have to yell because of acoustics. No! More than 400. It was just 400. I wouldn't have bothered. I would have been indifferent between the two, right? This is worth more than $400 to me. It turns out much, much more. Because I'm willing to give up $400 to get something of greater value in return. That's why I get out of bed. I'm willing to exert the energy to take the cash out of, you know, write a check or use my credit card because this is worth more than $400 to me. How much is it worth to Apple? Less than $400. They make a profit. So this is what we call win-win, right? I won because I gave up something less valuable, $400, and got something more valuable, an iPhone. Apple won by giving something less valuable to them, an iPhone, and getting something they wanted, cash. So the beauty of a free market is when we do these voluntary exchanges, when we pursue our self-interest, then they are win-win transactions. Now, they're not guaranteed to be. You might buy a lemon, you might make a mistake, you might overestimate the value of what you're buying, but your intention is always to make yourself better off by giving up something and getting something of greater value in return. Call this the trade of principle. The idea that trade is win-win, that we all benefit. But the motivation, self-interest. And this is the problem we have. What is our view of self-interest? Morally, not economically, ethically. What have you been taught? I know there are a lot of parents here, but what did your parents teach you about self-interest? I'll tell you what my parents taught me. My mother, I grew up in a good Jewish household. My mother taught me, think of yourself last. Think of others first. She taught me that morality, that nobility, that virtue was to be selfless, was to sacrifice, was to give, not to receive. Now all of that is counter to markets. In markets, we're not about giving, we're about trading. We're about making our lives better, we're about self-interest. Yet morally, we are taught self-interest is a bad thing. Think about somebody like Bill Gates. Bill Gates, former CEO of Microsoft, everybody know who Bill Gates is? Richest man in America, $70 billion, or some ridiculous amount like that, right? How did he make $70 billion? By selling us products. By selling billions of people products. And what effect did those products have on all those people that bought them? Make their life worse or make their life better? Better. They paid $100 for a product that they benefited much more than $100 from. Indeed, civilization as we know it today with the internet and phones and all this stuff would not exist if not for Microsoft having standardized everything, having done the magnificent job that Bill Gates did. And he made $70 billion while doing it, but he probably benefited almost every human being on the planet. He probably made, he changed the world in a deep, deep sense, changed the economic landscape of the world, the technological landscape of the world. Morally, ethically, while Bill Gates was at Microsoft making all that money, 
What was our view of him? Well, you guys are too young to remember this. But it was, eh, it was pretty negative. How can you make $70 billion? I mean, let's stick the Justice Department on them and go after them for antitrust or anything because he's a bad guy. You can't make that kind of money. I mean, you're, you're hearing a lot of debates about inequality right now. Wow. I mean, was Bill Gates unequal? Right? When did Bill Gates, now remember, this guy changed the world. He made everybody's life better off and because he benefited from it. <coughs> when did Bill Gates become a good guy? Yeah, when he left Microsoft, God forbid he should continue to make money, left Microsoft and started giving his money away, set up a foundation, started giving, right? That's how he's a good guy. Now he's not a great guy yet. We haven't quite got into the level of Satan. Why? Because he's still loaded and he lives in a big house and he flies in a private jet and he seems to be enjoying giving the money away. That's a real sin. <laughs> he's self-interested again. What would make it? How would we get him Satan? I mean, moral Satan. I'm not talking about Catholic Satan. Moral, you know, statues in the streets, boulevards named after him. Imagine Bill Gates Strong gave it all up. Gave it all to charity. Moved into a tent somewhere. And if he could bleed a little bit for us, that would be good. Because that's what we associate morality with. We associate morality with sacrifice. Giving something and expecting one in return. Nothing. Something of lesser value. Trade is about giving something up and getting something in return of greater value. That's not noble. That's not virtuous. That's not good. So in my view, and this is, this is really controversial, in my view, the reason we reject capitalism, the reason we move away from capitalism systematically, steadily, over time, is because morally we find it offensive. Capitalism is about self-interest. Self-interest is a vice. Self-interest at best is amoral. But morality is all about sacrifice, the opposite of capitalism. It's about giving, it's about sharing, it's about being selfless. Now that socialism is great. Socialism is good at sacrificing one group for the sake of another group. Sacrificing some individuals for the sake of other individuals. Who can be against that? You young guy, young guys are gonna be all taxed much, much more heavily than your parents and your grandparents have. Because you're gonna be have to subsidize their Medicare and their Social Security. But that's okay, because your job is to sacrifice for your elders. So morally, we accept that. So Obamacare means sacrificing young, healthy people for the sake of sick, older people. But that's okay, right? There's nothing wrong with that. All the teachings is to sacrifice some fathers, and indeed, those in need are supposed to be the beneficiaries of our sacrifice. So that's wonderful. This is all good. That's why there's no way Republicans can ever stand up and object to anything Democrats pass because they can't morally say, no, we want to do away with this redistributive plan, but morally, how can we? What about these people? They need it. Let me make one more point and then try to wrap up. Um, even when it comes to regulation, in my view, morality is worth twice. What do we think of people that are too self-interested, too self-interested? What are they going to do? When we look at a kid in a schoolyard, right, a schoolyard, one of you maybe, and we say, he's selfish, what do we mean by that? Do we just mean he really only thinks of himself, takes care of himself? Or do we mean something more negative? Something more negative, right? We mean he's a lying-stealing SOB. He'd do anything. He'd stab us in the back, he'd do anything to get his way, including exploiting us. He'd lie, steal, and cheat. We associate self-interest with lying, stealing, and cheating. So when a businessman, who we know is self-interested, right, he's about making money, but he's also, if he's self-interested, he's about making money, but he's also self-interested, which means he's potentially a lying, stealing, cheating, SOB. We better watch him. Because if we don't, he's going to do, he's going to cut corners, he's going to exploit us, he's going to take advantage of us, 
And what's watching him eat? We better regulate it. We better put controls over it. We better make sure that he behaves himself because his tendency is going to be, because the tendency of all self-interested people is, I steal and cheat. So you walk into an elevator, you know, I don't know if the school has an elevator, but probably does, and you'll see a little diploma on the wall. And the little diploma on the wall says that a government regulator has inspected the elevator and it won't fall and kill you. And you go, whoo, that's good. The government's taking care of you. And if that's your response, we're never going to have capital. <laughs> because what's the assumption there? The assumption is that if not for some government regulator, who, by the way, has no self-interest, he's just looking for the public interest and the common good, he's a good guy. <coughs> if not for him, those greedy capitalists would build elevators that would kill us. Because we know that the best way to make money is to kill your customers. <laughs> you laugh. But this is the assumption, right? If we didn't have the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, McDonald's would poison us regularly. And we are stupid enough to keep buying their products. I mean, it's mind-boggling, but that's the assumption behind all regulations. All regulations are, are, are geared to the assumption that greedy businessmen will lie, steal, cheat, and kill us in the end to make money. They're bad guys because they're self-interested. So I want to quickly offer an alternative moral code. A moral code that's not geared around sacrifice, that's not geared around selflessness, but geared indeed around self-interest. I believe that your moral purpose in life is to make the most of your life, is to live the best life you can live for you. That doesn't mean treating people badly, quite the contrary. It turns out people are pretty, a pretty important value to all of us. So you treat people well because trade, you remember that trade thing? You give them stuff and you get stuff in return. Spiritual as well as material. But the best relationships in life are relationships in which they're win-win, in which there's a trade going on. We don't like to call it trade because it sounds materialistic and low. But that's what it is, love is a trade. So I believe in a morality that says, let's figure out how to live the best life that we can live. Let's use the tools that we have to make the most of our time on this planet. To live a great life for us. And the goal, in my view, of a moral life is happiness. Is to be happy. Is to achieve happiness. And I'll just give you one tool, because we can spend hours just on this topic. One tool. What do you think is the most important, and I got into a big argument with one of the founders of the school over this, so. Uh, what is the one tool we have that allows us as human beings to survive, to thrive, to achieve, to build, to create? Because if you look around the room, you can look. We're a pretty pathetic animal. We're weak, we're slow, we have no fangs, we have no claws. Put us out there into nature, particularly if it's freezing cold, we don't survive for very long. Try running down a bison and biting into it. <laughs> not gonna do it. Or you versus the saber-toothed tiger, you lose. And yet, I had a bison burger last night. And last I saw a saber-toothed tiger was in a museum. And look at us. Look at us. We're thriving. What allows us to be here, to be successful, in spite of how pathetically weak we really are? It's this. It's our minds. It's our reason. So to be truly self-interested, to be truly self-interested, to want to live the best life one can live. <coughs> the most important thing one can do, the primary virtue one could have, is to use this tool. Is to be rational, to use one's reason, to apply it to your life, to think about what's good for you rather than feel what's good for you. Use your reason to dictate your life. Use your reason to dictate what's truly in your self-interest. 
If we had a morality that was focused on reason and self-interest, capitalism would be self-evident. Obvious, there wouldn't be a battle, and we wouldn't be drifting towards socialism as we are today. Thank you all. We have about 10 minutes, and I want students to ask him questions, not parents, because it tends to be where parents have some questions or community members. So students, I know it only takes one of you, and then you guys have to start going along with it. But feel free to ask uh, Dr. Brody any questions. How do you have to really speak up because the acoustics are too How do you have an opportunity for us to do those more than doubled out without like, government interference? So how do, we, how do we do with monopolies and trusts without like antitrust laws and government involvement? My view is that the way we understand monopolies is completely messed up. Right? So what is the what is the problem with monopolies? Prices go prices go up and quality goes down. But the fact is that in a real free market, there are no monopolies to the extent that they do that behavior. Why are there no monopolies? Because there's always potential competition. There are no legislated barriers to entry. And there's always alternative products. And I'll give you some I'll give you a quick example. The closest we ever came to what we would consider, and I put in quotes, a monopoly in the United States, was Standard Oil in the 19th century. This is uh, uh, Rockefeller, where he controlled over 90% of all oil refining in the United States in the 1870s. What happened to prices and quality while he controlled over 90%? You can go check this out. Prices went down every single year. Quality went up every single year. So why do we care, right? Now, why did Rockefeller reduce prices? Not because he cared about you, but because he knew that if he didn't do that, competition would arise, potentially domestically, potentially from overseas. There's always substitute products. What, 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 did, uh, what, did, uh, what was oil used for in those days? What was the primary use of oil? when Rockefeller had it in the 90 plus. What did they use it for in the 1870s? Lighting, kerosene. If anybody ever asked you who saved the whales, it's Rockefeller. <laughs> Absolutely true. Before Rockefeller, the primary way in which we lit our homes, and only the very rich could do this, because you couldn't afford it otherwise, was using whale oil. And that's why the, all the big whale industry was huge in the early part of the 19th century where people were becoming rich and could afford whale oil to light their homes. Rockefeller came in and made kerosene so cheap, the whaling industry went out of business, basically. And everybody was using kerosene to light their homes. What drove Rockefeller out of the business of, of lighting homes? Thomas Edison. Who would have predicted that? What government bureaucrat would have said, ooh, yeah, I see that. So there was no monopoly. I mean, the, the, the substitution product was Edison. Yet if we'd regulated Rockefeller, if we'd broken his business up, if we controlled it, prices would have gone up. Quality would have actually gone down. He wouldn't have had the economies of scale. But even more than that, by driving prices down, what Rockefeller did is it made other uses for the oil other than kerosene. So when the internal combustion engine comes along, late in the 19th century, there's gasoline, dirt cheap, because, rock, because of economies of scale, Rockefeller's made it so cheap, and they adopt gasoline for it. Now, I know today that's considered evil because of uh, you know, CO2, but we'll put that aside. Um, great, great invention, the internal combustion engine, and, and a big part of that is Rockefeller keeping prices. So I don't believe, and you see time and time again, when the Justice Department went after uh, Alcoa for 80-something percent of the aluminum business in the United States, prices were going down, quality was going up, nobody denied that, and yet they still went after them. When IBM was, was they went after them for having mainframes, well, there were other types of computers out there that were competing with mainframes. The whole conception of monopolies is distorted and it's, it's, it's perverted by the fact that when they teach you economics, I hope I'm not offending anybody. They teach you this idea of perfect competition and monopoly pricing, which are, which are myths. It's science fiction. There's no such thing as perfect competition. Nobody should teach it. It's nonsense. It's completely detached from reality. It's not, a, it's not what you want. Because if you had perfect competition, if we lived in such a world, there'd be no innovation, no creativity. If you, teach, if you take a class in business strategy, the whole purpose of starting a business 
is to create a monopoly. So you can charge as high a price as you can. And you do for a little bit, you know, Apple had a monopoly of iPhone for a little while, and then Samsung came and comes in, right? But they still have a monopoly over the fact that it's an iPhone, which makes it cool. So in a sense, that you pay a higher price than perfect competition would suggest for this, because it's got the iPhone label on. So the whole way in which the world works has nothing to do with those economic models of perfect competition and monopoly pricing. Other questions? What would you say the government's job during the session? The government's job during the session? Well, it depends on um, what kind of government it is. So th this kind of government, the one we have today, if the government had done two simple things during the recession, the recession, this particular one, would it be short and over with, and we would be growing faster today than we could imagine. Two things, cut taxes, cut regulations. So cut government spending, cut taxes, cut regulations, that's it. You wanna, what makes an economy boom is private enterprise. What makes an economy boom is you guys participating in the economy. You want to leave more money in your pockets to participate, more money in the pockets of business to make investments, less regulation to entice them to make those investments. But generally, I'm for less government spending and less regulations. Less and less and less and less. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a major recession in the United States in the 1920s, I think 1920. A, a huge drop, equivalent to the 1929 stock market drop. And the government did nothing. And within less than a year, the economy was growing again at full speed ahead. During the Great Depression, there was a big drop, and the government did something. It raised taxes, increased regulations, increased controls. What we got is the Great Depression. So, when, in, in the same year, government did a bunch of stuff. What did we get? A long recession. The less government does, the better, in terms of more. Ideally, what the government would do is cut, cut, cut. There's another question. Say that again. So how does how does the trickle down effect work in a sense that the wealthy get wealthier under capitalism, um, and uh, how does that trickle down? I don't buy that the wealthy get wealthier under capitalism. The productive get wealthier under capitalism. The innovators get wealthier under capitalism. The innovators and the productive and the hardworking. And the, and the really smart entrepreneurs could be poor one day. I mean, Steve Jobs was uh, middle class. Bill Gates was middle class and became very rich. If you're wealthy and lazy under capitalism, you lose all your money very quickly. If you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not smart about how you use your money, you'll lose it all. Right? In, in the 19th century, the closest America ever came to capitalism, they used to say short, short sleeves to short sleeves in three generations. The first generation makes the money, the second generation kind of doesn't do anything, the third loses it. So, uh, there's, there's a lot of mythology about wealth inequality and, and how wealth functions. But what capitalism does is it rewards hard work. It rewards innovation, it rewards entrepreneurship, it rewards creativity. And that can come from any place on the income stream and you could be successful. And the capitalism, more poor people become rich that rich people become richer. But, how, but it still trickles down. So let's, let's think about how it trickles down. It trickles down primarily by the fact that rich people, what do they do with their money? They don't spend it. They, you know, indeed, they spend the smallest percentage of, of anybody's income rich people spend. They invest it. Right? They save it. And what does investment mean? What do they invest it in? In businesses, in projects. What do those businesses do? They hire people. They pay them wages. Right? So the capital that's invested by businessmen or by wealthy people who are active, who are investing, who are, is creates the jobs that everybody else, all of us, are going to be employed in. Without people making money, without people creating wealth, there are no jobs for the rest of us. I mean, Jobs are not, okay, um, a workplace doesn't start with workers. A workplace starts with somebody with an idea and somebody with capital. 
And without that idea, without that capital, there are no jobs. And as workers become more and more productive, what happens to their wages? They go up. Because if they don't go up, what would the worker do? Let's say I start out minimum wage, and I'm doing really well, and I really become really good at what I'm doing, and I, but my employer is not raising my wages. What would, he, what would you do? Leave the job and go somewhere else and say, look, I'm really, really skilled. And there's competition for skilled labor. There's competition for productive people. So your wages will rise. So you cannot have jobs, you cannot have economic activity, you cannot benefit the poor unless somebody is making a lot of money. But I don't like, generally, I don't like all these distinctions. I don't like the idea of the wealthy and the middle class and the poor. Because in a ca truly capitalist economy, that is very dynamic. People are moving in and out of all those categories. And what I care about is that productive people get rewarded for their productivity. Capitalism is a system that does that. And unproductive people, lazy people, people who don't want to work, get penalized for that. Capitalism does that. And it does it for the wealthy, for the middle class, and for the poor. No matter where you are, capitalism treats you the same. To the extent that you are productive, use your reason, apply to your work, you do well. If you don't, you do poor. Time for one. What's that? That's it. So, um, first, let's give uh, Dr. Brewer. Uh, a couple of things before you go. Uh, please, students, not parents, not community members, students, please help the facilities guys, uh, the people that are working, also in the comments. Please help them out by folding up chairs, stacking them next to the racks that are on stage around. Please do that before you drink. Um, other than that, if you want to come on up and say hi, I know Dr. Burns is happy to do that. So, um, again, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.